Uh, again, thank you for joining us for today's 2022 spring quarter Michael M. Davis e-lecture. Chaz is excited to host a visiting scholar at the Crown Family School for Social Work Policy and Practice, Shuang Bella Liu, Assistant Professor at the University of Hong Kong in the Department of Social Work and Social Administration. In a moment, today's discussion moderator, Assistant Professor at the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice, Ji Ying Ma, will offer brief opening remarks and a formal introduction of today's presenter. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Zoom Q&A pane or the chat function for answering the questions following the presentation and to allow a more thorough discussion between Drs. Liu and Ma. A recording of this webinar will be available at the CHAZ website at chaz.uchicago.edu and will be archived on the CHAZ YouTube channel, which can be found by searching for the Center for Health Administration Policy, uh, Health Administration Studies. And now Zhe Ying Ma will introduce today's presenter. Great, thank you so much, uh, Keith. Hi everyone, it's my honor to introduce to you Dr. Shuang Lu uh, for today's presentation. Dr. Shuang Lu is an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong, Department of Social Work and Social Administration. Her research focuses on child development in disadvantaged families and capacity building of nonprofit organizations. Her current projects include examining the role of grandparenting on rural left behind families resilience and using school based intervention to improve migrant youth's psychosocial adjustment. Combining micro and macro perspectives, much of her work is aimed at better navigating welfare resources and promoting mental wellness among disadvantaged youths across societies. Dr. Lu was a visiting research faculty at Yale University Child Study Center earlier this spring, and now a visiting scholar at the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice. Today, Dr. Lu uh, is gonna present on a topic that is key to social work and social policy. Um, and the title of her talk is Urban, Urbanization, Migration, and Youth Mental Health. Without further ado, let's give the floor to Dr. Lu. Thank you. Thank you, Keith and Jing. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, very nice to be here and uh, honored to give this talk today. And uh, my name is Shuang Lu. I'm, as introduced, an assistant professor currently working in Hong Kong. And this semester, I've been doing some visiting here in the US. and. Um, yeah, and my research mostly focused on urbanization, migration, and uh, how that impact youth and families. So today's presentation will be kind of an overview of a few projects that I've been doing. All right. So a quick overview of the agenda today. First, I'll start with background. Uh, why am I focusing on migration? And uh, also a recent study that uh, my team is doing on synthesizing global evidence on research on uh, migration and youth mental health. And then uh, I will zoom in a little bit to talk about uh, in China's context, how does migration look like and how that affect children and youth, uh, especially on their mental health, uh, mental well-being. And I will uh, talk about a quantitative study and a qualitative one, as well as the intervention study. And uh, in the end, I'll leave with some time, probably 20 minutes or so for a discussion. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free or any comments, suggestions, feel free to type in the chat box or uh, raise them after the presentation. Okay, first, why migration? Um, here, when we talk about migration, um, it mostly started in the past few decades, uh, past 50 years to be specific, there has been a stable trend of migration, both uh, including those moving across borders and those moving within their own country, usually from rural to urban areas or from smaller cities to bigger cities. Um, and of course, migration includes war, refugee, um, and forced migration. Uh, but here, uh, my research mostly focuses on economic migration. So refugees are not part of the uh, presentation today. And uh, there are, uh, there, it's hard to estimate migrants, right? Because they move around a lot and uh, there's rarely a uh, national system that tracks migrants like uh, except in a few countries like China and uh, but overall the estimate is there's uh, about 740 million internal migrants and 
uh, cross-border migrants is about over 200 million. So, so 740 uh, together, there's uh, a lot of people moving either cross-border or within their own countries. Um, but although there are a lot of internal migrants, meaning those moving uh, move within their country, but there's less research attention to them. And uh, it's understandable that we typically think people move within their country has less adjustment uh, difficulty because uh, either they speak the same language, they move within the same culture, they're not too far away from their home. Uh, so their support system is still there. So there are a lot of understandable reasons, uh, but uh, nevertheless, this is a gap in research. And um, although these uh, internal migrants may do, uh, may have less uh, things to adapt to, uh, but they are facing some common challenges as uh, just as cross-border migrants, including welfare exclusion uh, in their destination and limited access to social services, lower socioeconomic status, uh, low social mobility, lack of quality of education, etc. And uh, there has been a lot of research on uh, migrants in general, and studies have shown uh, overall there's a negative finding. I would say that uh, environment-wise, migrants are often faced with marginalization, lack of social support, uh, like we just said, lower social mobility, and economic disadvantage. And um, that has an impact on their mental health. And this is about migrants themselves. And um, also existing services, because this population, uh, especially when we're talking about internal migrants, they are understudied, underserved, and um, also existing interventions. Uh, there's a lack of uh, investigating mechanisms of change. Why do certain interventions work better for migrants? And, um, and why do certain services do not work as effective for migrants compared with locals? So uh, to start with my research today, I will first present a, this is preliminary finding of a ongoing project. Uh, and I'm uh, also collaborating with Dr. Rob Chaskin here at the Crown School. Uh, we are looking at a synthesis of global research evidence on how migration affects youth, uh, children and youth mental health. And here we are focusing on non-forced migration and particularly those move for uh, work and for economic reasons. And so uh, this was, we, uh, the search started two years ago now. Uh, it's a very large uh, study and we searched uh, uh, these databases. And um, here is an example of the key terms we searched. And as you can see, we have labor related terms, uh, migration, of course, and children and youth related, uh, mental health outcome related, and also uh, study design related. So um, basically, we're looking for studies that focus on uh, children, youth age, um, or majority of participants were below 18 and uh, focusing on at least one aspect of their mental health outcomes that could be emotional, uh, behavioral, social uh, outcomes, or just overall mental health. And uh, one thing I want to note here is the mental health definition here, we're not just looking at symptoms uh, or problems, but we also looked at positive aspects. Uh, for example, subjective well-being, uh, resilience, uh, and so forth. And I'll give a more detailed review, uh, detailed introduction later. And oh, I see some questions. I'll, I'll answer that later. And okay. So here is um, the scope of the search. We started with quite a large number of studies. Um, oh, one more thing I want to note is we also, in addition to English web uh, databases, we also searched the China National Key Infrastructure. I believe that's the full name. It's a Chinese um, database because we know that there's a lot of uh, internal migration going on in China. So that's why we included that one here. And so uh, we identified 
over 16,000 studies. And then um, after abstract screening and full test screening, we ended up at 75 that is eligible. Uh, but as I said, this search was done uh, two years ago. And uh, during the two years, we've been doing a lot of work uh, in extracting data and all these screening. And But we will conduct another round of search uh, very soon before uh, we submit this for publication. And uh, what, what are those 75 studies about? Uh, scope of literature, there are majority uh, from Chinese studies in, in, uh, in Chinese and 20 something in English, but some of the English studies is also about uh, migration within China. And uh, we see 62 internal migration and that's mostly uh, within China and then 13 cross-border uh, migration studies. And that includes uh, Greece, Turkey, Switzerland, Italy, etc. And the year of study, the earliest one started in 1979, but uh, we do see a trend that's um, majority of studies, they started uh, 2006, which is really where we see globalization has started to uh, come to research attention. And outcome domains, we uh, the most of them focus on emotional well-being and uh, some uh, so, for example, depression, anxiety, psychological well-being, uh, as I mentioned, resilience or self-esteem, uh, behavioral domains, uh, delinquency, those things, and social domain, uh, peer relationship problems, um, as an example, and also overall uh, mental health status. And uh, most of them compared to migrant youth with uh, children at their destination. And a few of them did compare migrant youth with people who stayed behind in their place of origin, uh, who did not move. And also there's a few that investigate both comparison groups. And um, th this is average, just an average number of all the sample sizes across the studies. But as you can see, there's a wide range. And age-wise, also there's a wide range, um, but I would say preschool, um, there's only a few studies on preschool children, mostly starting from primary school, secondary school onward. And um, here are some initial findings. And as I said, this is an ongoing study, so we likely will do more uh, data cleaning uh, a little bit and also with our second round search, uh, we will probably add more studies in so the final results will probably look a bit different. Uh, but based on what we have, um, I will give you a few examples on um, a few more concentrated outcomes. So the first one is internalizing problems. Here we could see so not all studies reported internalizing problems right and um, this Mostly is measured by the Child Behavior Checklist, CBCL. And um, as you can see, uh, so, so the midline, uh, we coded the, all the effect sizes as if you see the dot is to the left of the midline, then that means migrant youth are doing worse than locals, um, either that's locals at destination or locals at their original place. If you see uh, the dot is, uh, to the right of the midline, that means the migrants are doing better. And so uh, depends on, although the uh, outcome direction is, uh, some are positive outcomes, some are negative outcomes, but we adjusted the uh, directions in this uh, consistent way. So here, as you can see, synthesize these uh, studies, we see there's a uh, significant negative uh, difference or significant difference between migrants and local youth. And we see that migrant children have more internalizing problems overall. And the effect size uh, is not, is, 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 I would say approaching medium, but of course depends on the exact outcome, uh, how we define small, medium, large uh, depends, but um, based on standard uh, definition, this is a uh, small, difference uh, that approaches medium. And then when we look at emotional symptoms, also uh, this is more, so, so this is more specific emotional symptoms uh, compared with the outcome just now was uh, about overall internalizing problems. And here we can see again, synthesizing all the studies. And as you can see here, majority is about Chinese internal migration. 
And uh, the red dot is the summarized summary effect. And we see uh, migrants are still toward the left um, of the middle. So which means they're doing worse, having more emotional symptoms than locals as well. And in terms of behavioral domain, externalizing problems, uh, similar results, we do see uh, migrants are doing worse. They have more problems than locals. And um, this is total mental health problems. So that includes both emotional and behavioral difficulties adding together. And uh, we see that there are some variation and especially there's one study, we see that um, migrants are doing, they are having fewer problem behavior than uh, locals, but in uh, overall putting together migrants are doing worse uh, in overall mental health problems. Loneliness, um, it's a, uh, I found it to be a very commonly studied um, variable in the studies and mostly in the Chinese studies. And so uh, we do see that um, putting together and migrant children are feeling, uh, they have higher level of loneliness compared with migrants, sorry, compared with locals. And uh, this is also significant um, difference. Delinquency and de uh, deviant behavior, uh, again, we see the effect is negative, but it's not really significant because it touched a bit on the zero on the midline. And uh, in addition, we looked at the positive domain. So self-esteem is uh, one kind, uh, is one uh, domain that's commonly measured in um, the positive uh, well-being areas. And we see that, again, here, uh, my, uh, migrants are still doing worse than locals. And this is also uh, significant. And adaptation, um, and here we, that includes uh, social adaptation, self-adaptation, school adaptation. Uh, we put them all together because of the limited number of studies. And um, so here we do see that um, again, same results, migrants are doing worse. But there's one thing, uh, one study that showed migrant children actually have a uh, higher urban rural identity. So they identify as uh, urban nurse more than urban local kids, which is an interesting uh, study. But um, putting together the overall result is negative. And I think this is the last one, subjective well-being. So again, um, also, we see migrants putting together have a small negative uh, effect. Migration has a small negative effect on youth uh, subjective well-being compared with locals. And so um, here's just a quick overview of the summary effect. Of course, there's more um, subgroup analysis and meta uh, regression, and those analysis will, will, do, will have more uh, nuanced uh, analysis later on, but this is just a summary of the main effects. And uh, one thing I do want to see is the difference between cross-border versus internal migration. However, uh, cross-border in total, we don't have as many studies, uh, so the result may not be representative. But based on what we have, uh, we do see that both cross-border and internal migration uh, negative have negative impact on youth mental health. Um, but and the uh, the extent is kind of similar. So for this is the cross border ones, we only have a few um, studies on this outcome. And uh, the summary effect is 0.14, while internal is 0.21. Uh, uh, well, so it looks like internal migrants are doing just not as good as the uh, cross border ones. But we will, uh, after we compile hopefully more cross border studies in the second round search, then uh, hopefully we'll be able to update the results a bit. So in summary, for this uh, synthesis, a quick overview, uh, what we found is migrant youth overall, they're doing worse in mental health across emotional, behavioral, and social domains. Uh, but uh, so here, I did not uh, have the space to show this in uh, the analysis, but we do record uh, where whether these migrants are enrolled in the same school with their uh, urban peers or whether they're enrolled in a separate school uh, only for migrants. And so that's more a phenomenon uh, specific to China. And I will talk more about that later. Uh, but what we found is there's a narrow gap between public school migrants um, 
and those with urban uh, those urban locals. So meaning um, segregating migrants with their local peers would uh, worsen their mental health outcome. And uh, we do have some positive findings. A few studies found that migrant youth have higher uh, life satisfaction. And uh, as I mentioned, there was a study showing they have um, greater urban identity than uh, their local peers. So uh, of course, we need to have more studies to explain this. Um, but I think one possible explanation is that they are uh, life satisfaction because they move from a poorer area to a better uh, social society overall. So that increased their satisfaction probably. And urban identity, to me, I think that might be an overcompensating mechanism where they are trying to fit in and they think they fit better. Um, and even more so, they think of uh, being an urbaner um, as a something they are more proud of compared with the local peers. Okay, so that's a quick overview of the global synthesis. And next, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to China's migration context. Uh, excuse me. So why am I interested uh, in this uh, population? First of all, there's a huge uh, migrant population in China. And the last, last well, two years ago, the estimate was nearly 300 uh, million migrants in China who move uh, from, usually they move from rural areas to urban areas and work for uh, non-agricultural industries. And um, as you can see, uh, the number has been increasing over the past decade or so and uh, increases by millions every year, uh, sometimes 10 million a year. So it's a large population that's still uh, growing. And on uh, this map, I think it's intuitive. Uh, it's intu it intuitively shows how migration is affecting almost every region in China. And uh, here, the red parts are where people move in and the blue parts are where people move out. Uh, and the darker the color means the more dense migrant population, the ratio of migrant population compared with locals. So here we see, um, the darkest reds are uh, in the east coastal area and uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen as an example are where people move in the most. Um, so a lot of manufacturing industries are in these areas and that's probably what drove migrants here. And within the blue parts, so this is where people, people move out, but within these uh, regions, there are like regional centers that usually is the capital city of a province that draws people to move in from surrounding rural areas. Uh, and one more thing I want to mention about China's uh, migration is uh, their household registration system, or in Chinese it's called the hukou system. So this system, um, think about it as an internal visa. Um, so it started a few decades ago in 1958. Uh, at first, when it started, the aim was to uh, have a better controlled or better planned urban economic development so that not everyone would uh, be free to move to cities so that cities can have lower unemployment rates, um, lower uh, poverty, and also for the central government to allocate resources better across the country. So that was the original purpose. And this uh, system basically registers every citizen uh, of China to either a local citizen or non-local. And uh, also before there's also this agricultural versus non-agricultural type. So say if I'm born in Evanston, uh, then if I want to move to uh, Hyde Park and I would need uh, to apply for uh, approval and also I will need um, to change my resident status from uh, Evanston to uh, High Park. And before I do that, I could go and work in High Park, uh, but I may not be able to get the same benefits as High Park residents do, uh, like going to High Park uh, schools or uh, using their hospitals as an example. So, so within China, there's this system in place for decades and today, um, Still, a lot of migrants are living in uh, and working in cities like Beijing and Shanghai for 
um, could be 10 years, 20 years, but they still uh, hold non-local residency. Okay. And uh, with the increase in migrant workers, also there's increased number of children affected by migration. And there are some uh, that move with their parents um, or they could be born in the city, but because their parents are still non-local residents uh, officially. So the kids are also considered non-local uh, residents. And um, these children by 2010, there's an, uh, 36 million of them. And uh, there's another group, which I will, skip, will not cover today because of time limit, but there's another group that's called left behind children and um, who stayed behind in their hometown while their parents moved to cities to work. Um, so we see that left behind children are larger in number, but migrant children are increasing in a much faster rate because of China's urbanization. So um, this is a uh, theoretical framework that uh, I will I will mostly discuss my next two studies with. And uh, one is biological theory, where we look at children, not uh, we look at them within their uh, family environment, neighborhood, and the macro environment. And also uh, resilience theory, where uh, we look at both risk factors and protective factors or resources these children have, and how uh, these resilience, uh, these protective factors uh, exert their effect within each of these levels. So um, my main research aims are uh, threefold. First one is to look at how does internal migration affect youth mental health at these uh, diff through these different levels. And two, resilience, uh, look at resilience in specific uh, context of Chinese culture. And resilience used to be thought as a uh, psychological trait. Uh, we are born with a certain level of resilience and some children are just naturally coping better than others. Uh, but over the past, I'll say two, three decades or so, resilience um, research has shifted its focus. Uh, now we, uh, a lot of people think resilience as a process and also it's not just something um, specific to an individual, also it, uh, it, it is related to individuals' environments, uh, including their interpersonal relationships and their culture as well. Uh, so as an example, something uh, like religious belief in an African tribe might be a uh, protective factor for them, but may not be a protective factor for Chinese children. So uh, there needs to be more specific research of resilience in uh, different contexts. And the third aim is to um, think about what preventive interventions can be used for uh, migrant populations. And um, I will talk about uh, mixed method study. And uh, first one is a quantitative study use, using secondary data analysis to look at what's the effect of uh, rural urban migration on youth mental well-being. And second, I will talk about qualitative study with 10 migrant families in Beijing and uh, looking at how they navigate their daily life and what does uh, what protect their well-being. Okay, so uh, uh, first, the quantitative study, uh, I think I'm using too much time, so I'll be quick about this. If you're interested, feel free to uh, go search for this paper and it will uh, tell you more details about it. So basically, in the secondary, secondary data set, uh, I looked at uh, microsystem, uh, mezzosystem, uh, exosystems, more distant labor, neighborhood conditions and uh, macro system factors and how that affects uh, youth uh, psychosocial development. And um, the three main outcomes I'm looking at is depressive symptoms, social relationship, and uh, children's aspiration of their future. Um, and we see that look, just comparing the different groups, we see a constant disadvantage in migrant children. And so here we're comparing 
uh, rural non-migrants versus rural left behind who stayed behind by their parents moved to cities to work and uh, migrants who uh, moved to city with their parents and urban local kids. And so we see uh, the same pattern across three outcome is the left behind, uh, well, they're, yes, they're doing the worst, um, highest depression, uh, lowest social relationship and future aspiration. And followed by migrants who moved to, sorry, followed by uh, rural uh, non-migrants and, and then migrant kids are actually doing a bit better than uh, those peers stay in rural areas, but they're not doing as good as urban kids. And when we break um, the parents into rural uh, non-migrants and migrant parents and urban parents, we see also a similar story. So migrant parents seems like they, in some domain are doing a little bit better than uh, rural parents who um, stayed in rural areas, but uh, in terms of education, in terms of income. But if you look at uh, these two groups together, they're not that different, but there is a um, very distinct gap between urban parents uh, with these two. So in terms of income, in terms of education, we could see um, a very, uh, we could see a huge difference. So, um, and here is the last table for this one is looking at regression effects um, of all the variables adding together on um, children's uh, outcomes. And so I will, again, because of time limit, I won't go into detail of the table, but overall what I found is that uh, migrant kids, in some way they are doing better than uh, their rural counterparts, but um, this difference or this advantage disappeared after we factor in, in uh, environmental factors. So, uh, but urban kids, as you can see here, they are constantly doing better uh, than the other three groups. And uh, we see a uh, important risk factor for uh, migrant children is parent-child argument. And uh, this later on also showed up in our qualitative uh, interviews where parents mentioned they uh, they have very high stress because their their economic condition, also because their children's education, and uh, children also face a lot of stress because academic uh, performance. And so there's a lot of tension within these migrant families, um, even more so than their local counterparts. And so. Uh, as the data show, um, this is also a risk factor, strong risk factor for all domains. So in summary, living in uh, urban areas benefit child development looks like, but that benefits uh, are clearly limited. And um, also uh, we see the importance of family environment and especially parent-child conflicts within these migrant, uh, within families. Okay, just checking the chat box. Um, okay, so then, uh, for next, I'll talk about how do migrant youth navigate urban life. It's a qualitative study, uh, and I did field work in Beijing with 10 migrant uh, families and their teachers, also a local social service organization, a nonprofit organization that serve these migrant families. And uh, what I was interested in is, um, how do they experience these difficulties in daily life and what are some resources or protective factors that they found helpful? Okay, a uh, quick overview of their backgrounds. Um, so as you can see here, uh, let's look at this column. Most of parents, they have been living in Beijing for quite a long time. However, they are still considered migrants because they don't, uh, they could not get a, a local household registry yet. And um, education level is relatively low. Uh, parent occupation, as you can tell, some of them are running family business and some are uh, temporary workers, um, truck driver and uh, street vendors. So, uh, relatively low socioeconomic status. 
And um, this is a typical home environment for uh, these migrant families. So this is an apartment for the whole family and uh, the parents will sleep here and the child sleeps here. And so uh, they usually live in the outskirt of Beijing, not at the center because they cannot afford the rent. And um, also these are usually subdivided units uh, within a uh, building that has a lot of uh, my, mostly migrants live in there. And sanitation is a concern as well. Uh, I forgot the exact, exact number, but a few, the minority of these, um, inter these families had a private bathroom. And um, this is an example of a public bathroom that one family shared with seven other families. Um, and it's, as you can see, there's not much privacy and not much uh, flushing, no flushing system. Um, so sanitation is a uh, issue and this is neighborhood safety. Uh, so on my way walking back from a family, this is where their home is located. Um, and as you can see, there's a high rise building um, coming up in at the background. And so uh, because of urbanization and uh, construction, um, a lot of and real estate industry emergence. So a lot of the migrant communities are being torn down. And this is an example of that. And as you can see, kids are playing uh, on daybreak without parents supervision, which could be dangerous. And so from the interviews um, and from the field observation, uh, what I found for uh, these migrant youth, what uh, impose risk on them and protect them are uh, there are three level of factors individual interpersonal and uh, macro environmental level so uh, as an example at individual level stress of study is something that's always mentioned by all of these uh, 10 children and uh, because their parents have had such a uh, challenging life. They expect their kids to go to college and get a good job. And that's the only way of moving up uh, on the social ladder for the whole family. So the kids also internalize that expectation. And uh, when they don't do well in the exam or when they um, failed uh, something at school, they will be super stressed. And also um, this created a lot of tension within the family uh, between parents and the child. But on the other hand, these kids are quite independent. They take care of their own daily life and um, they have gained some new insights um, from moving from a rural uh, village to Beijing, a uh, world, a big city. Um, and also it built up their future aspiration. A lot of them said, well, I want to uh, be successful, want to make a lot of money in the future. And at interpersonal level, uh, there are also some risks, and especially migrant parents, because they work at unstable shifts and work for extra long time, uh, compared with their local uh, employees, they have let, they lack the time to spend with their children. Um, and also, um, some parents, they, as this one said, they cannot tutor their kids' homework because of their own limited education. Uh, also, by moving from rural to urban areas, uh, a lot of the kids, they lost uh, something meaningful to them. Uh, could be um, the, the contact with their friends, could be a relationship with their grandparents or other family members that they used to uh, be very close to. And uh, on the bright side though, although parents cannot um, they lack the time or ability to supervise their kids, but they do try to provide as much support as they can, uh, either it's financial or emotional uh, or daily life support, they did try their best. And uh, also, uh, I think half of the kids had siblings and the siblings usually, they become best friends to each other and take care of each other. Um, extended family support is one thing uh, I think uh, probably unique to Asian or Chinese culture and that's found very helpful to these families, especially when parents are not around. Grandparents step in and help a lot with taking care of the children and emotionally uh, support the kids. Finally, peer support is also something uh, mentioned by all of the interviewed kids and they, especially for 
uh, someone who just moved to a new school, uh, their classmates and friends really help them with adjusting to the new environment. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. And uh, finally, on the environmental level, um, some risk factors are found here. Um, so as the pictures we just show, uh, we can see that migrant families are living in poor housing and neighborhoods. Uh, compare with their local counterparts who usually live in high-rise apartment buildings. And also, uh, however, this is better infrastructure already compared with where they came from in rural villages. And um, also they have, they're faced with educational deprivation. So uh, in Beijing, a lot of these migrant kids, they cannot go to public school because of their non-local residency status. So instead, they will go to private schools that's built especially for uh, migrant kids. And so that kind of segregates migrants from uh, their local peers. And also education uh, quality is usually lower in these um, uh, private migrant schools because they don't have any government funding. And um, however, Compare with their rural peers, they do feel uh, schools in the city is, are generally better uh, in terms of the curriculum and teachers. Uh, it's just better experience than rural education. And finally, migrant families have very low economic opportunity compared with locals um, and starting from parents' um, social economic status and also for migrant kids, it's harder for them to go through the college admission exam and um, so forth. But uh, because of time, li time limit, I will skip that for now. If you're interested, I'm more than happy to discuss later. Um, however, again, compared with their rural areas, they do have better income in the city. Um, they also receive some uh, extent of social support from nonprofit organizations uh, that um, use, that provides service in urban areas. So uh, this qualitative part, I think it nicely illustrates the quantitative finding where we see that uh, migrant kids seems like they're doing a bit better than rural kids, but they're not doing as well as urban locals. And this uh, qualitative part uh, partially explains why. So the implication from this is uh, at individual level, we uh, will want to help migrant families to cope with their daily adversities, and especially in terms of stress reduction. And that um, is true for both migrant kids and their parents uh, who face stress for different reasons, um, but that also affects their family interaction and builds up a lot of conflicts in the family. So at the interpersonal level, we found parent-child relationship to be a key factor affecting uh, migrant youth mental health and also peer relationship is very important to them. Finally, at the environmental level, uh, rural Western areas where people mostly move out of, uh, there needs to be sustainable regional development so that people, uh, families would not need to move all the way to Beijing, to Shanghai to find a decent job. And um, also in cities where they've moved in, um, there needs to be a better community development um, such as the segregation between migrant and local community. Uh, also, there's limited service, uh, social service for migrants. Um, and of course, it depends on the city. Uh, some cities have better support, some have uh, poorer support, but overall migrant uh, families and youth are underserved. And uh, uh, I, okay, I'll, go through the next part uh, quick, quickly. And so um, in the past two, three years, I switched my research focus a bit to intervention research. And um, I use mindfulness as a intervention uh, approach to address the stress part for both parents and children. Uh, also, it can help with peer relationship and uh, parent-child relationship. As a quick example, um, I'll skip this part. If you're interested, uh, we can come back to this later. Um, so basically, there's uh, quite a number of studies uh, on mindfulness showing it has um, multiple domains of uh, benefits to children and to adults. 
Um, and however, this research mostly, is, um, we did a systematic review and most of the research we found were in uh, US, uh, UK, Netherlands, um, Canada. So there are few research uh, of mindfulness on uh, in developing countries and on low or social economic status population. Uh, but we think the benefits of it can actually um, it can actually bring a lot of benefits to these populations. So um, we designed a um, sixteen week uh, one semester of mindfulness intervention in uh, migrants in five migrant schools in Shenzhen and. Here, um, we have a, uh, so it's a cluster uh, randomized control trial. We randomized by classrooms and uh, we trained school teachers and social workers to uh, deliver the intervention. And we also provided assistance uh, to help out in the classroom uh, and students and parents fill out questionnaires um, as, a, uh, as outcome measurements. And we, uh, our outcome, target outcome include resilience, emotional symptoms, and their adjustment. And so here's an example of our intervention protocol uh, where we included uh, increasing children's awareness of their body sensations using mindfulness in everyday life, like eating uh, and uh, being aware and manage their emotions and also uh, how to use mindfulness in communications with the parents or friends. And gratitude is something we were trying to develop compassion and self empathy. And last topic is um, just a review. So each topic we have two sessions. And uh, pilot study, uh, we did this a while ago and just to test the feasibility and acceptability. And also we want to see whether mindfulness could um, increase children's resilience and that uh, leads to better mental health outcome. And what we found, uh, because it's a pilot study, so uh, we collected some qualitative evidence and uh, we found it's well accepted, uh, also fits school environment uh, well, and um, school staff were engaged uh, during the intervention, and that was especially important during COVID. Uh, but they do feel that um, this 16 session is quite short, and they feel they need longer term practice to make it more effective. And uh, we do see that uh, mindfulness show positive um, so positive relation to resilience and resilience also uh, is positive related to social cultural adaptation and positive effect. So here we don't see that resilience um, have any uh, any effect on anxiety, depression and negative effect but it shows mediation effect on the positive outcome. So this is something in uh, resilience literature would be called promotive effect. And uh, our, uh, I think one possibility is because these children we recruited are uh, general migrant population, they are not screened as uh, having high anxiety or depression. So for them probably, uh, the buffering, they don't need much buffer, but what they need is something that can promote uh, their mental health, which is already uh, okay. So then after the pilot study, we did the main intervention. And here we we're targeting at-risk students who, are, have, uh, who have higher anxiety and depressive symptoms. And we randomized by individual. Um, and so um, let's see. Again, this is still ongoing. We are waiting to collect a third wave of data, uh, hopefully, actually a fourth wave of data, hopefully um, will not be affected by COVID, but um, we'll see. So the preliminary results uh, of pre and post test is uh, we see that for uh, those in the mindfulness group uh, versus control group, which is a standard psychoeducation curriculum, uh, we see that uh, migrant youth in the mindfulness group showed uh, better academic adjustment, uh, better environmental satisfaction, and both group have growth in positive affect, but um, there's a little bit interaction here, but we do see that our active, uh, our control group was quite strong too, actually. 
Um, and due to time limit, I'll skip this one. Uh, so, okay, in conclusion, um, we, I so summarizing all the studies I've just uh, talked about, I think it's China's migration illustrates, it's a perfect example that illustrates Marx's uh, false consciousness uh, concept, where these migrant families, they move to cities in search for a better life and better job. Um, however, because of all the institutional exclusion and discrimination, they um, are this, these promises of uh, being successful and being rich in capitalism is illusionary, uh, illusion, illusionary to these families. And um, despite these uh, disadvantages, these migrant families and uh, youth do develop some kind of coping strategies um, at multiple levels. And mostly what we see so far is that individual level and um, using interpersonal resources. So uh, an important resource, as we just mentioned, is uh, from extended family members and peers as well. Um, however, despite their efforts to navigate um, their daily life in urban areas, they are still facing structural barriers that seems uh, quite unbreakable. And the most significant one is the rural urban inequality and plus uh, regional inequality. So it depends on where they migrate to. If they migrate to a smaller city, probably they will have better access to service. But if they migrate to a major city like Beijing, it might be even harder to access education, uh, pension, those things. But uh, because of market economy, uh, it's self-driven. So uh, migrants, of course, tend to move to bigger cities for uh, better income, better economic opportunities, or they will perceive they will have better um, opportunities in those cities. And uh, finally, I think mindfulness-based intervention is an, just an example. Uh, it's not the perfect approach. It has a lot of uh, issues it cannot tackle, but uh, I think it's an example of some preventive interventions that we can uh, use among uh, migrant youth. And um, that could be beyond China's context. And um, after COVID, but, uh, well, we're still during COVID, but um, with COVID, uh, there's a global youth mental health crisis going on. And uh, I think uh, mindfulness and other interventions can be a um, example of doing prevention among uh, community setting. And finally, um, so although my research intervention research so far focused most on individual and interpersonal relationship change, but uh, I don't think it's enough to tackle this whole migrant uh, youth issue. I think, uh, of course, there needs to be a larger macro level policy reform and uh, community interventions, hopefully sometime in the near future. Okay. And here's uh, some acknowledgement of my funders and collaborators. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lu, for this very wonderful, important, and inspiring talk. I have many questions inspired by uh, this presentation, but I'll just uh, ask one or two to, to start the conversation. So according to your um, review, it seems that most of the research about uh, youth, youth mental health and migration actually came from China, and you talked about um, uh, their main findings. And I was interested in whether like these researchers um, also besides researching the mental health of these youths also intervened uh, in promoting their mental health and what are some of the existing intervention strategies and uh, what are the pros and cons compared to like uh, the mindfulness-based uh, intervention that you are using? And um, so that's uh, one question. So basically the kind of existing intervention strategies um, about youth mental health in China. Okay, um, so for the first part, are you talking about the synthesis, uh, the review? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in existing research, besides talking about the kind of status of mental health, of these youths, uh, whether they also uh, have done any intervention. 
Uh, that's a good question. So for the, uh, I think I probably skipped this because of time. Uh, in the systematic review, we focused on, we did not focus on intervention research. We looked at cross-sectional studies and uh, longitudinal and use longitudinal uh, studies, but we, because we're trying to compare migrants with locals, uh, so we were not looking at interventions that worked for migrants, uh, comparing like pre-test and post-test or intervention control group, but we used uh, locals as our comparison group. So that was the, uh, I guess it was because the main purpose of that review was just to look at the mental health um, discrepancy between migrants and locals. But in terms of intervention, uh, I think that will probably go in our discussion part of it in that review uh, in the end. Um, and uh, I'll use China as an example. There are quite a few interventions delivered by uh, mostly nonprofit organizations as well uh, in, say, rural China for the left behind children. Uh, um, as an example, there's the uh, blue envelope organization that um, match a pair's role left behind kids with local kids as pen pals and they write letters to each other um, to as an emotional and social support. There's also um, at the government level they do have um, efforts in rural areas for the left behind families. They have government employees who would go check on them and uh, provide uh, school uh, assistance and provide uh, subsidy to family living. Um, so I do see a lot of services um, focusing on the rural left behind families. Uh, unfortunately, it's because of some uh, unfortunate incidents that happened within the left behind families because um, children have no adult supervision. So that had some uh, incidents. But then uh, I think for urban areas for migrant children, um, there are services for migrant families, like tutoring service for uh, the families in the community center. And uh, what else? City exploration, uh, take the kids to go to museum, to parks, to make them feel more belong to the city. Um, and also, what else? School social work service, because these migrant schools usually have few, fewer resources. And so some uh, social organizations will provide social work service that's otherwise uh, unavailable to these migrant schools. But those, uh, at least the services I'm aware of, mostly are provided by nonprofit organizations, not uh, from the government level. And so I think um, definitely at the government level, there's much more can be done. Uh, that's a bit loud. At the government level, there's much more uh, can be done to help the migrant youth in the city. Yeah. Hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I've invited Lin Yun to ask her questions. And um, so I'll, after that, I'll uh, read the questions that have already uh, been submitted. And I encourage uh, the audience to also use the Q&A function to ask more, uh, more questions. Lin Yun, uh, if you don't mind um, just yeah. raising the questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful and also informative presentation, uh, Professor Lu. I personally learned a lot since it's really resonant with my own research interest. So I have two uh, questions. The first one is more about like a methodology question. So I wonder if you conduct like the quality assessment in your like a systematic review for your, for those included study, right? Like I wonder if you excluded those study who were, like that were identified as low quality in your meta analysis on exam on examining the effect size. That's kind of my first question. My second question is for the uh, qualitative study. I wonder you, you, if you also explored like uh, children's school experience there. Like for instance, if like a positive uh, teacher and student relationship might be also a potential like a protective factor there. In general, I really like your uh, intervention study, which I believe are very important and also innovative and benef beneficial for migrant children in China. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lang, for the questions. Uh, so it looks like you're really paying attention to all the details in the presentation, which is good. Uh, for quality assessment, uh, yes, we do have quality assessment, but uh, as I said, this is an ongoing study. So we just had the final, uh, not final, the main results out, but uh, we do have quality assessment um, criteria that was rated and the data is extracted, but we have not put them together. But yes, I will, um, 
also do some sensitivity analysis with only probably the high quality studies on their own. And um, yeah, uh, so that would be our next step. And for the qualitative study, um, yes, we did, we did look at their school experience. So uh, for each child, we interviewed the child, uh, the parents and one of their school teacher, the head teacher in the school. Uh, we also went to, well, I also went to their school uh, and their home uh, to as part of my field observation. And we do find they enjoy school experience a lot. I think that is a protective factor. Um, but from the 10 uh, participants I had, uh, most of um, the protect the part they enjoy about school is with friends and their classmates. So peer support uh, seems to be a huge thing in my qualitative study at least. While teacher support was not, it wasn't mentioned as much uh, in their uh, interviews. And they do say they in, enjoy school activities a lot, which they don't usually like uh, art classes, music lessons that they don't get in their rural uh, village. So I think the infrastructure and the curriculum in urban areas in general it, um, serves as another uh, most protective factor that helps with their psychological development. Um, yeah, so peers and the urban education system in general, I think. Great, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. I'll ask uh, Clara's first. Uh, so Clara Wang asked, uh, in your study, do you differentiate migrant families in some ways, for example, based on their economic statuses or distances bet uh, between their or or origins and the city, uh, city they migrate to? Um, I, su I suppose these factors also might influence the effects of migration. Hmm. Uh, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I, we did have the data on their uh, region of study, and uh, that's not, although that's not reported in every study, but we do have that variable. Uh, we want to look at, in terms of the region, whether it's a super developed like Beijing or whether it's a less uh, smaller city, would that affect the uh, youth mental health as well? And we also have uh, social economic status. Uh, race, ethnicity, although this is not commonly reported in many of the studies. Uh, we also have age of the children and gender composition. So uh, social economic status, uh, we looked at parents' education, family income, uh, and family size. So all these were in our data extraction. And again, it will be the next step of uh, moderator analysis and meta regression analysis. So yes, we do hope that we will try to, we will be able to distangle the, the difference between, we know migrants are doing worse, but right, but, but for what group, right? So we will um, add those into our moderator analysis later. Yes. Uh, what's the other question? Yeah, so Jean asked the question, um, again, uh, she iterated everyone's appreciation about how you examined uh, the effects of migration and, and mental health and distinguish the micro, meso, and uh, uh, macro uh, impact. Her question is simply, how long do you expect the Hukou's yeah. policy to last in China? Well, Jean, I don't know how, um, maybe I can talk about what I think and then you can talk about what you think. Um, I think, well, I think it's gonna be there for um, at least a few decades, I think. Uh, it's been there for six decades now, over six decades now. And there has been some reform because a lot of people are saying there needs to be reform. It is hurting migrant population, rural population. So uh, partly because of the Hukou system, it created this urban rural divide. Um, in addition to economic inequality, uh, rural residents in general are also facing other types of institutional inequality like education, healthcare. They cannot easily transfer, say, their pension or something from rural to urban areas. So that's uh, been discussed a lot and there have been reforms in the past few years, but I think the reforms so far are not benefiting the most uh, poor and low, lowest social economic status migrants. So uh, say Shenzhen introduced some new policy that they can uh, help migrants settle down and change Shenzhen residency, but they need uh, migrants to accumulate certain points 
by say you have a stable rental place for three years, you get one point. You have um, contribute to pension for three years, you get uh, another point. And so by accumulating points, they decide uh, who can change to Shenzhen residency first. And I think that actually benefit the high tech migrants and more skilled migrants more than uh, those who are really uh, hurting by really hurt by the institutional inequality at the uh, meaning those at the bottom uh, social economic status group. Uh, how long it will be there. <laughs> uh, also, there's a study showing that who the status, the residency, who co status is tied to over 20 something welfare benefits. So uh, your education, healthcare, um, and pension, all these things depend on your HUCO. Uh, it's tied to your HUCO status. So I think it's not easy definitely to change it because if once you change this system, you need to reform all the other system that's developed basic, based on this system. So um, it's not an easy job, but I'm hoping it will happen uh, in the next decade uh, or two decades or so. Yeah, my, my sentiment is, Kind of the same, so I, I think it's um, a very entrenched institution. And uh, there's a question from earlier of the talk that I didn't, uh, I don't want to miss. Um, David asked uh, whether there is research on the migration of military families and that are relevant. Hmm. Yeah, uh, of course they're relevant. I think. Um, uh, also earlier, I think I mentioned like refugees and forced migration. They. Uh, are not part of my research, but I do think uh, with what's going on in the world right now, uh, globalization is only one reason of migration, right? There are many, many other kinds. And I think migration, despite its uh, reason, it does affect family and youth in some way, uh, either positively or negatively. So uh, definitely, I think that's a relevant topic. Um, yeah, it's just not part of my research so far. Yes, but thank you. So I have another question, um, um, but again, I encourage uh, others to raise your question. I have a question on a slide that you skipped that is gender. Um, so, I mean, I'm interested in how, um, how migration impacts uh, the mental health of uh, girls and boys and um, youths of other genders uh, differently. And for example, in the context of China, um, the common understanding might be that in many rural areas, boys are more valued than girls because of not just like cultural beliefs, but also systems of uh, property, et cetera. Whereas um, those uh, systems might not be so um, uh, salient in urban areas. So I wondered whether there are uh, discussions about uh, the gender impact and the gender differences in uh, youth mental health of uh, migration and also uh, what's uh, the interventions, uh, what are some of the intervention strategies that might be sort of like more gender focused? Hmm. Uh, good catch. Uh, so for the slide that I skipped was about, we, we did see a gender difference in the intervention effect in the school-based mindfulness intervention. We see boys actually benefit more from the mindfulness practice, but girls uh, benefit more from the control group uh, curriculum, which is the psychoeducation, uh, more of a diet didactic um, teaching. And uh, I think, so first to explain that, I think it could be for uh, boys, it's, it seems less familiar to them. And because our mindfulness curriculum is more experiential and have a lot of activities like breathing exercise to regulate your feelings. And so for boys, that might be something new to them because they're not used to um, pay attention to their feelings and um, regulate emotions. And so for that, I think um, they benefit more uh, because they started lower. And for girls, uh, maybe they like choir, and maybe they like the didactic lecture part more uh, than experiential uh, activity. But we do think this is a quite interesting results. And we uh, collected some qualitative interviews from the kids and we are currently analyzing those qualitative uh, evidence. Hopefully we will be able to explain that gender difference a bit more. Um, in terms of overall uh, gender difference, I cannot say a conclusion yet because it's part of our systematic review variable, but we have not run that um, moderator analysis yet. 
Uh, so I'll get back to you later with that result. But in uh, one of our previous uh, study of, with migrants in Wuhan, actually, uh, we found that girls have higher internalizing problems and uh, boys have higher externalizing problems. So girls have more emotional difficulties and guys have more behavioral difficulties. That's based on one study. Um, I cannot say it's generalizable to all other migrants. Um, yeah, but that is an example of the gender difference. Um, in terms of intervention, um, I think that's a good point. So far, our intervention has been mixed. We do not specifically look at gender difference. We uh, group them together. We do all the exercises together and uh, we control gender as a moderator, but we have not specific design component that fits uh, different gender groups. But I think that's a very interesting point moving forward. And especially given our mindfulness intervention did show some gender difference, right? So I think um, that would be an interesting thing to add on later. Hmm. Okay, um, so as we approach the end, um, I really want to um, invite you to share a bit of uh, some of your thoughts on the current situation and maybe uh, the future. You said that you uh, are planning to run uh, an additional uh, review uh, about uh, the, what happened uh, or the literature for the last two years. Um, but um, before you do that, I wonder uh, what your thoughts are uh, uh, on the uh, impact of COVID-19 on uh, migration and youth mental health, because of course, uh, migration has been like uh, seriously impacted, uh, global migration has been seriously impacted by the pandemic. Um, and um, in China, as I know, like many families, migrant families um, might um, for a while have, uh, have to return back home because of the lack of job in cities. And that actually, I heard anecdotally created uh, quite some conflicts within families. But I, I wonder sort of like, what uh, are your hunches about uh, the pandemic and its impact on this subject area? Hmm. Um, again, that's a great question. I think um, starting from China, I think uh, there's research already showing COVID-19 has uh, disproportionately affected migrant families. They are, there's rising unemployment, yes, but the, um, the migrant families are getting uh, impact more than local wage earners. So um, in terms of social economic status, I think migrant families, at least in the next few years, uh, at least in China will face more economic pressure. And so that can create uh, we know that um, there, when family uh, members are facing economic pressure, they could uh, have more tension within the family as well. So, so, so I think in the next few years, um, the parent-child conflicts and family relationship in general for migrant families would have more difficulties than before. Um, and in terms of globally, I think uh, either it's economic migration or um, other types of migration. Uh, I think migrant youth, uh, partly because COVID-19, but partly because of the political environment we're in today, I think um, migrants are just in general facing more discrimination than before, say a decade ago, and also uh, facing more um, cultural barriers and more negative attitudes in society in general. But I think uh, one more thing that we could think about is how to really promote uh, mutual understanding between the host society and migrant population. And um, yeah, and it's not an easy question uh, because there's conflict of interest everywhere and there's politics everywhere. But I do think as, um, ordinary citizens, um, what we ultimate, if we can realize that we are just all human beings and there's an interconnectedness among um, all human just by where you come from, then um, I think that's an important thing that as a global society, we should uh, be aware of and keep reminding ourselves. Mm. <laughs> I don't like that answer your question. But just definitely, definitely. I, I think that that, that indeed, um, we are at a very challenging time and um, it requires all of us to, to imagine and to, to endeavor to create a better society. 
and, uh, and more inclusive society. So uh, we are at the end of our time. I just want to again thank uh, Dr. Lu for this very important, insightful, uh, and informative talk, um, both about uh, existing research and about uh, her very important uh, firsthand intervention research. Um, I personally definitely look forward to uh, reading more about um, your research, and um, and I wish you the best of luck in continuing the the very important project. Um, so. Do you want? Uh, do you want to say any uh, last word for the presentation? I oh, uh, just want to thank you all for being here and thank you for staying uh, for an hour. And if you have any questions or ideas, feel free to email me, and I'll be here for a few more months. So I really look forward to talk more with you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you.